Welcome to Minnesota Legislative Report, our region's longest running public affairs program. Lawmakers from Northeastern Minnesota are joining us today for a recap of the week's activities at the state capitol. This is your opportunity to call or email your legislative questions and have them answered live on the air. Minnesota Legislative Report starts now. Hello and welcome to Minnesota Legislative Report. I'm your host, WDSC News and Public Affairs producer, Greg Grell. Well, with about three weeks left in the legislative session, several omnibus finance bills are scheduled to reach house, the House floor early next week. Expect a lot of conference committee meetings and a hectic final few weeks of the session. There is plenty to talk about today with the lawmakers that represent you, so get ready to call in your questions right now. Locally, you can dial 218-788-2844. If you're calling from outside the local area, dial our toll-free number, which is 1-877-307-8762. You can also email your questions to askmlr at wdsc.org. Now it's time to introduce the legislators who are joining us in the studio. Great group today, starting with Representative Julie Sandstead, a Democrat from Hibbing. Welcome. Thank you. Senator Eric Simonson, a Democrat from Duluth. Welcome back, Senator Simonson. Thank you. Representative Liz Olson, Democrat from Duluth. Welcome, Liz. Thank you. And Representative Mike Sundin, also a Democrat from ESCO. And we want to thank, thank you. you all for being here on such a beautiful day. And we hope uh, we've got some viewers out there that are going to be ready to call in some questions. But Representative Olson, I thought we'd start with you. It's your first time on the show this, uh, this part of the session. And uh, just kind of give us your feeling about where we're at right now. Three weeks left, a lot of work left to do. What's your summation of the session to this point? Yeah, well, we're seeing a lot of the omnibus come together, omnibus bills come together and come to the floor. We had our first of that this week, and we'll be seeing a lot more this week. So we're down to the wire on doing what we need to complete this session. We have yet to see a bonding bill, which is a big thing for our district and for regions around the state. Um, we have yet to see a pension bill come to the floor yet, which is something that in the, on the House side, the Senate's already passed that. And then we have some other just critical issues that we need dealing with that I hope we tackle around elder care and opioid abuse that we're seeing some pieces of in omnibus bills we're still falling short on. So I think we still have a lot of work to do and I hope we can put some bills in front of the governor that he'll sign, otherwise we're gonna go through a veto process and then we'll have to come back and continue to scramble to get this work done um, by the end of session and like you said, just about three weeks. And Representative Sandstead, how about from your perspective, uh, where do you feel things are at this stage of the game? They're pretty much where I expected them to be at. It's been busy. There's been a lot of committee work going on, um, but the omnibus bills are coming together. Different for me this year from last year, we're starting to see them kind of grouped together. We put the uh, K-12 and the higher ed together in one larger education bill. I think there's been a little bit of talk of uh, the possibility of that happening with some of the others. Um, but I think, I think we're pretty much where I expected to be at this this time of the year. The next couple of weeks will be what we fondly call the sausage making <laughs> right, of the right. session. I've heard it called, you were mentioning some of the bills being lumped together, that there's going to be an omnibus, omnibus bill, meaning a whole bunch of bills together. Representative Sundin, is that a good way to do it, do you feel like? Or uh, what is the reason for putting all those bills together? Like Absolutely that? not. It's, it's, it's a poor way of doing business. Uh, there's, there's a lot of good things, let's say, in the uh, jobs bill that I really do like. And if it gets lumped into uh, uh, another bill that uh, has a lot of poison pills in it, uh, a lot of bad policy, uh, I'd be forced to vote against a, a good bill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Representative Olson, is that part of the political gamesmanship by rolling these all together? You're hoping that you're going to get more votes because somebody's going to like parts of this bill and parts of that bill? And they're going to vote yes just to get those parts passed? Yeah, we get in. I think this is where we get into the real politics of session is these last few weeks when there's the strategy around what goes in an omnibus bill that may entice us to have to feel like we have to vote for something. Um, I think this is also the time where we're seeing the standoff between um, what uh, the Republican leadership in the House and the Senate and the governor and trying to figure out what the governor, what they can force his hand on by putting these bills together in this way. So this is really definitely where we see the politics come out. And unfortunately, because of that, we're not doing the work that we need to do to really address some of these critical issues. And it, and it becomes this, are we even going to get it done by the end of session when we're trying to just um, play politics with this? So I would agree with Representative Sundin that this is just becomes a really difficult place when we see these giant bills come together in this way. Now we'll get into some more specifics as we go, but I want to bring Senator Simonson in and just to talk a little bit about where you feel things are at on the Senate side at this stage. Well, I think if you look at it from the perspective that with three weeks left, um, uh, we're probably where, where we need to be if the bills that we were passing were acceptable to the governor. 
uh, but it seems like most of the things that we are passing are not going to be acceptable to the governor. On Thursday of last week, we passed one of these omni omnibus bills uh, that rolled every single area of law into one large bill. It was about 600 page supplemental budget bill um, that encompassed everything except for taxes and bonding. Um, and there was hundreds of reasons to vote against that bill, but uh, the governor early on in session was good enough to lay out in writing to both the House and the Senate things that he would accept and things that he would not accept. And everything that he said that he would not accept, they put into the bill. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure where they think that this is going, but uh, with three weeks left, it's very hard if, if the governor vetoes one of these bills to, to come back and start over and think you have enough time again to get it done. And does that make the conference committee process more difficult? I don't know if some of you have served on conference, but when you have bills that are this big, Representative Sundin, it must be difficult to kind of parse that out in conference. Certainly, I served on a conference committee uh, as a freshman, and there's a lot of uh, backroom uh, engineering going on at that last minute, and it would just simply complicate uh, the issues. Uh, and th it's just not good decision making when you're in a hurry and you're under a lot of pressure. Uh, and just to complicate it with uh, more and more issues, uh, it doesn't serve the state well. All right, well, we'll be getting questions in from viewers, but right now we're gonna go over a few things. Representative Sandstead, you serve on the Child Care Access and Affordability Subcommittee. That's obviously a big and important issue, and especially in rural and greater Minnesota where there isn't enough, enough child care to begin with. Any news to report from the subcommittee? Any work being done that maybe can help this situation with child care access and affordability? Um. My report isn't great, it's pretty frustrating. We've had uh, plenty of hearings, lots of discussion, but there's nothing moving forward, which you know is really a frustration for me because <coughs> there is such a need for it. There's a shortage, it contributes to the workforce shortage. Um, so when you don't address one problem, it makes another problem worse. And we would have liked to have seen some movement on it, but with uh, the Republicans in control right now, they're not calling those bills up onto the floor, and as I understand, they're not in the overall HHS reform bill, so mm -hmm. it's not good. What about from your standpoint, are there some, some is there some low-hanging fruit, so to speak, some things that could be done, you think, to increase the availability of child care, especially in greater Minnesota, where we have such a shortage? Well, we've had some really good discussions about some grant opportunities. Um, I put a bill in for uh, just some grants to be offered to uh, new providers starting up um, to help them with some of those startup costs. We've talked about co-ops. There's, there's a lot of uh, potential out there, but you can talk all you want unless somebody's going to take action on it. There's not much you can do. And Representative Olson, you, you yourself have a, a young child. You probably have seen this problem in person. Uh, any thoughts at all on what, uh, what, what kind of things might be able to be done to, to fix the problem? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a really great question, and I've actually talked to my own child care provider that is a center, a nonprofit center here in Duluth, and what happens is there are f the rates that are charged that the daycare centers can't make what they need to to be able to pay their staff living wages and give them benefits and do all of those things and also provide a, a, you know affordable care for everyone. But what we could do as a state to help with that is some of the reimbursement rates. St. Louis County has one of the lowest reimbursement rates for child care. Um, outside of the metro area. So it's hard for child care providers when they're not even, um, when someone is getting assistance with their child care because it is so expensive, a lot of families do need assistance. And when they get that assistance, but it doesn't even, the assistance <coughs> they're giving the provider doesn't even cover the cost, it leaves the provider in a lurch. Mm -hmm. And so the provider then has a really hard time being able to pay staff and take care of their overhead when they're, the money they're receiving isn't even covering the actual cost of child, you know, caring for the child that's there. And so I think we definitely need to do that, especially around infant care. Infant care is incredibly expensive, and it's, we have a huge shortage of that in our area because the ratios, you need more providers to infants, and so therefore it's a very expensive way um, to do child care. And so I think one of the things that we could do this session, if we wanted to, with a surplus, is raise the reimbursement rate. And that would greatly help child care centers throughout our entire state that are in that pinch of not getting the money they need um, from the reimbursements from the state. And Representative Sandstead, it seems that the in-home daycare, the, the individuals who want to provide daycare, they're having a harder and harder time meeting some of the standards that the state is setting, and also there's the reimbursement issues. Is there anything that's being done to help folks who want to run a daycare, say, in their own home that uh, can help make that, you know, more access available for folks who have children? 
Well, first, I just want to echo everything Liz said on the reimbursement rate. I think if there was one thing that we could do, it would be that. Um, as far as what's happening with home-based daycare, um, I know in my area, the area that I represent, I've been meeting with local providers to talk about some of the hurdles that they're facing. Um, and some of those things are county-based, some of those are state-based regulations. A lot of the uh, concerns over over-regulation are things that we've been discussing in our, in our subcommittee. But again, we're not really moving forward on that. I know that the Department of Human Services, Reggie Wagner, um, I met with for over a couple of hours one-on-one, uh, -on -one, kind of talking about some of these things. And I know that there's a commitment on the part of the department to really look at those issues and move forward, but not at the cost of you know harming children or anything like that. So it's a very fine line. Um, so I think there's going to be some revisions that you'll see kind of come down the pike here soon, sooner than later. I know at a state level they're working on that. Anybody else want to add anything about child care? Uh, Senator Simonson, uh, the Duluth School District's been trying to sell the Duluth Central High School property for several years. You've got a bill that you're carrying that could help. They just recently reduced the price. Talk about that bill a little bit. Right, it's a bill that we've had uh, a, a couple of sessions in a row here now, and I think actually Representative Olson uh, got it into the tax bill on the, on the House side. Uh, we've not actually seen our tax bill on the Senate side, but um, the the provision in the bill just provides a sales tax exemption for a potential developer that may perhaps would buy that site and make some improvements, some investments, and it would provide them some relief from the from the sales tax. And it's just trying to find any additional incentive that we could to try to get uh, that property sold and redeveloped into a, into a taxable property. But um, I also saw, you know, a couple days ago that the school district has now reduced the sale price of that property. So perhaps between, between the two things that maybe we can actually get this done this year, we'll see what happens. Representative Olson, you want to mention uh, the role that you played with the tax bill? So yeah, so uh, Senator Simonson is carrying the legislation and has in past years as well. Um, and I carried it this year in the House and we were able to get a hearing in, in the tax committee and overwhelmingly it was supported by everybody in the committee and it got rolled into, as we've been talking, the larger bills. So, so it is in play right now and we'll see what happens in the Senate, but we're hopeful that this can continue to the finish line and we can, we can do this to help incentivize uh, developers to take a look at Central and to um, get that property back on the tax rolls and be doing good for our community again. Mm -hmm. We are watching Minnesota Legislative Report. This is your opportunity to call in with questions to the lawmakers who represent you. Phone numbers are on your screen. Uh, you can call in like Brian from Hibbing did. And I'll start with Representative Sundin because you, you sit on the, uh, the Mining, and Forestry, and Tourism Subcommittee. But Brian is a Hibbing Taconite employee. He's wondering how many more deadlines uh, is the state going to allow Chippewa minerals to miss before someone else comes in to mine that area? I think that's talking about the, the, prop, the project on the Iron Range. Representative Sundin. You want to talk about that, and then I'll let Representative Sandstead chime in. I, w I, w I really wish uh, uh, Representative Metza were here to uh, deal with that because I'm not really in tune with the with the uh, comings and goings of the uh, those transactions up there. But uh, we're certainly anxious to get something done up there. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I I really don't have a dog in that fight. You know, but uh, the sooner the better to get that thing moving along. Representative Sandstead. So it's a great question. Um, a lot of these negotiations are really between the governor, the DNR, and the, the businesses themselves. Um, as far as the legislators on the Iron Range are concerned, I think it's safe to say that we don't want to see a continuation of the deadline time after time. We would like to see uh, the company either hit the deadline, and if not, then move on. Um, we just had a conversation this past week over the same topic as far as the Iron Range delegation, and that would be in a bipartisan effort we are, we are pretty committed to our, our drop dead dates of the end of May, the end of June for what's in place. And so I don't think it's gonna get you know, pushed out beyond that. And for a little background, there's a, a battle going on between uh, Cliffs <laughs> Not and, <a> little battle. <laughs> and Chippewa. A lot of lawsuits flying around and a lot of he said, he said things going on and uh, where the truth lies might be a little bit hard to discover right now, but uh, we'll be paying attention and probably following up with that. Great. Uh, Representative Olson, the Omnibus Health Finance Bill was passed recently. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, that's a, a big bill, important bill. Yeah, so we saw that come across um, last week. That was paired with, so as we were discussing, that not only was that an omnibus bill itself that contained all the policy and finance, mm -hmm. it was then um, put together with another set of omnibus bills, which, uh, which was it last week, was it, um, was it transfer? 
transportation. transportation. Okay, yeah, they're coming together. So it was with transportation, <laughs> but the HHS um, well, we'll be, it started to come together and we'll actually hear it on the floor though on Tuesday, I believe. So we haven't heard it, but what we did do last week as a health and human services um, piece of that is we issued a minority report, which is something when we see an omnibus bill come out like that and our caucus and those that sat on those committees don't see the policies that we had, had supported or championed or we believe is right for Minnesota to be a part of that, we can issue what's called a minority report. And so we did that. So that may be what you're referring to that actually happened last week was we actually brought that to the House floor. And so that included things uh, putting forward what we would have had wanted to see, which is a Minnesota care buy-in. We had, as Representative Sandstead said, the recommendations from the subcommittee on child care, uh, what we could have done, a couple pieces of legislation that we couldn't have done that. Had some work on the elder care issue that we didn't see in the omnibus bill, um, so it will have some more teeth to taking care of our elders. It also put in the opioid, the penny a pill, the stewardship fee, um, to be able to charge drug manufacturers the penny a pill to help fight the opioid epidemic. So, so to highlight those is because we did not see those in the giant omnibus bill that will be coming forward that we will debate on the floor this week. So we put that in front of the body last week to issue our minority report. Representative Sands said anything you'd like to add to that? Representative Olson covered it pretty well. You did a great job. I did want to ask both of you, you both serve on a committee that's called uh, the, uh, let's see, the Health and Human Services Reform Committee. Representative Sandstead, what's what's that committee been looking at? What, what's that about? That's our policy committee. Mm -hmm. So we hear everything. Mm -hmm. It's one of the largest committees, I think, far reaching. So you, we heard the elder care issues. We hear uh, some of the stuff from the child care subcommittee. We hear everything from dentistry to um, tattoo parlors to, you know, anything, any kind of issues there. So very comprehensive. Okay. Representative Sundin, uh, we talked about this a little bit last week, but uh, this past week the House did indeed vote to throw out the wild rice standards, and that means right now there are no standards for sulfate letters, levels in water. Is there a plan going forward, or what, what's <coughs> happening with that? That's a work in progress, and it'll probably be a work in progress uh, five years from now, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Uh, right now, the uh, 10 parts per million uh, standard that uh, has been in place is based on research from back in the 1940s. The standard was set in 1973 and never adhered to. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, some of the waters, let's say the Kawishui River, is already out at uh, 25 parts per million uh, without any mining activity. So uh, uh, there's a thought that we could uh, customize the standard for different watersheds or different lakes. And uh, I, I don't know where this is going to end up. I don't think anybody here does. Is that with the Kawishui, is that just the just the natural sulfate level then it appears? Exactly. That, so so it isn't a contribution from some Sure, and it varies throughout the state. Just like uh, almost any mineral or any anything in any watershed, it varies throughout the state. Senator Simonson, what about on the Senate side? You serve on the Environment and Natural Resources Finance. Has there been debate on wild rice rules there? So that bill did come through our committee. Uh, I supported the bill, and I think we're taking it up tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken, on the Senate floor. Um, but this thing has, uh, I mean, we could talk about this probably for two hours mm -hmm. about <laughs> the details behind it, but I see this uh, not as something that I'm supporting because I think we don't need a standard. It's something that I'm supporting because our process is inherently broken. Um, and, and I think trying to work with the governor's staff and the PCA staff, uh, we, we have just not been able to get anywhere in a productive fashion. So I, I think that this is an opportunity uh, to say, you know, we need to just take a time out. We need to take a step back. We need to bring all of the interested parties back together and figure out something that works best for Minnesota. Uh, the PCA has tried to put forward in rulemaking a standard um, that wasn't widely supported by any of the interested groups uh, and was basically rejected by administer administrative law judge. So we're either back to where we were uh, with the standard that's been in place since the 1970s, which has never been put in anybody's discharge permit to date, um, or, or we need to go forward with something new. And, and I think by you know voting for this bill, it's not to say that you know anybody's against wild rice, and it's not a it's not a vote against the tribes, and it's not a vote against Minnesotans that believe that wild rice is important to our mm -hmm. culture or our heritage. It, it is simply saying that 
we need to take a step back and we need to look very closely at this and figure out something that works. We absolutely probably do need some sort of a standard and, and we'll figure that out. Uh, but then the, the, the larger piece of it is how, you know, what role does the state play in helping to pay these, uh, uh, p helping to support the financial problem of, of, of complying with the standard. And it's not just businesses and, and industry, it's every wastewater municipality system that's out there, including, including perhaps WLSSD. You know, we don't know, but I, I think it's the right step to take and, and uh, there's a lot of discussion about this bill and uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there, of course, but I, I do think it's the right step. Representative Sundin. Thank you, I did carry an amendment on the House side uh, for that bill and uh, it would have provided uh, half a million dollars to facilitate talks with the, the tribes and all the, all the parties and that, that uh, amendment was shot down. Uh, it, was, uh, it may be offered again and if it is, uh, passed it, th that bill may uh, uh, find support from me in the house. Mm -hmm. so. Representative, oh, I'm sorry, Representative Sands said you represent a mining area. What's the thought up there? Uh, are you seeing any consensus at all on what should be done? I would very much echo what Senator Simonson said. Um, my perspective on this whole thing is it's broken. It's very, very broken, and um, I think there's kind of a a widespread understanding of that, and that's probably why it hasn't been enforced since 1973. Um, I definitely think it's appropriate to have a standard in place. What we currently have is not what I believe is the appropriate one. I think we need to do something that's uh, scientifically sound, environmentally responsibly, culturally responsible. Um, and we just kind of need to hit the reset button right now and go back to the table and make sure that we're taking in all, all aspects of this you know, important issue. All right, well, thank you all for your thoughts. I think we'll probably be talking about this for years to come on Legislative Report, it sounds like. Uh, Representative Olson, there is a bill that's moving through the House uh, that lowers the legal bar, so to speak, for suing an employer for sexual harassment. That got some attention this week. Can you talk about that bill a little bit? I'm not sure if this comes out of the situation at the state mm -hmm. capitol, but I know there's been a lot of emphasis this session on sexual harassment. Yeah, I mean, we did see since um, when we were in uh, in between after last session and the start of this session is when the conversation really started to heat up with two legislators, one one in the Senate and one in the House that um, stepped down from their seats and were filled in special elections due to sexual harassment charges or allegations. Um, so yeah, this has been a topic and there was a, um, on the House side, there was a um, working group, or I don't remember exactly the title that um, that Representative Pepin called together and had been chairing and been doing the work of bringing uh, folks in to really figure out how we tackle this um, internally too, as a within our own legislative body. Um, the governor has put forward some recommendations for the executive branch and how they could handle um, sexual harassment complaints. So I actually, this the legislation you're mentioning is carried by Representative Pepin. She's a Republican. I fully support the legislation and a number of us, I think we have um, on both sides of the aisle have signed on to that bill or a clone bill like it. It is good. It is a really good piece of legislation and it actually starts to get at, to tackle at how hard it is right now um, to put forward a sexual harassment um, how you know to tackle to tackle this issue legally, and so it helps make it um, more that we could actually get to some resolution with what she's trying to do here. So I support that. I think a number of us here do support that, and um, because it, it's starting to get there, she does have an uphill battle to climb um, with that. So it'll be interesting to see when you have one of the members of leadership on the Republican side carrying the legislation. I'm hopeful that we can see that cross the finish line, but the ball's really in their court to make sure this moves. Now, one of the concerns that has been pointed out is a lot of businesses are worried about you know a lot more lawsuits and that this is going to be a boon for the for the legal community uh, it's kind of a, a fine line to come up with the proper wording for legislation uh, let's just like to hear other comments from folks um, representative Sandstead. I don't know I think um, I don't know that I agree that it's going to be you know a, a boon for uh, legal services or anything like that I just I think it's a, it's solid um, language that's out there. I supported the bill as well, and I do hope it can it can move forward. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else want to comment, Rep Senator Simonson? So, probably the first time I've ever shared an interest in a bill with Representative Pepin, but I also <laughs> agree with this legislation, and I and I 100% disagree with the idea that uh, it goes too far. Mm -hmm. 
I think if folks are concerned that this is gonna, this is gonna cause uh, a lot of issues to come to the surface and, and get addressed, I think that's a really good thing, frankly. Um, and it, it, it just tells me why we're doing this because it brings me to a place where it says, there are a lot of things happening right now that aren't being reported uh, because A, people are either uncomfortable reporting them or B, there's no mechanism in place for people to make the report. Mm -hmm. So if this causes uh, more issues to be discussed and brought to the forefront, I think that's a good thing. All right, we'll move on now to uh, other issues. And uh, Representative Olson, the House has passed the Safe Seniors Act to protect seniors and vulnerable citizens from financial fraud. Can you tell us about that, Bill? Yeah, so that bill came on the House floor this week. I don't, I'm not quite sure where it's in the Senate, but I think it had pretty much overwhelmingly, you know, support on both sides of the aisle. It was a piece around fraud and seniors, and it, it was a good bill. So I think it does some of what we need to do. However, it does not tackle what we've heard as the crisis around elder abuse. We have the Office of Facilities Health um, complaints that's getting 400 complaints a week a week around elder abuse. So their office has done a fantastic job um, triaging those, really getting their systems in place. They've had turnover in leadership um, to really dig in and figure out what they need to do on their end. But unfortunately, we have not seen legislation come forward yet that's actually going to help curb that abuse where it's happening um, around whether it's assisted living facilities or other you know, facilities with services like that. And so um, I'm glad we passed the legislation we did last week, but that is not a substitute for, for tackling what we need to to really prevent elder abuse, not just the fraud portion mm -hmm. that we heard. But I'm, I'm hopeful that bill will actually get, address some of the fraud issues that we know are prevalent within our seniors and our elders. So. Representative Sundin? Um, I think it's great that these uh, issues are being addressed now because this, uh, what they call the silver tsunami, is uh, <laughs> heading our way and uh, it's only, these problems are only going to be compounded and, and grow in numbers. So I'm, I'm glad we're looking at them now rather than uh, five years from now when it's going to probably affect me even more <laughs> profoundly. And Representative Olson, are we, when you're talking about financial fraud here, are we talking about people who are, are acting as a legal authority and stealing money, or are we talking about the, all the different telephone fraud s schemes that are out there that uh, seniors, and my mother almost fell for one of them. Right, right. <laughs> and I think the legislation, and I'd have to reread the legislation to, to tell you, get into the intricacies. Yeah. I think it was set up to tackle kind of both and, mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, you know, we'll have to see where the teeth are to really deal with it. Sometimes it's a really great piece of legislation, but it lacks the teeth or the substance it needs to to really address it. So um, we could dive into it, but I think it was intended to uh, both end to what you're saying for both of those pieces. Representative Sundin, uh, one of the things that the state's been working on for quite a while is the MinLARS system, the state's vehicle licensing and uh, registration system. You serve on the transportation committee. What can you tell us about what's happening there? It seems like an ongoing problem, a, a deep black hole that money pit that's just going away. <laughs> it, it's, been a, it's been an ongoing problem here, I guess, for, for almost a year now since the, the rollout uh, uh, first failed. Uh, it, it's been uh, an absolute mess, a frustration for a, a lot of car dealers. Uh, the uh, registered, the deputy registers that are scattered throughout the state have taken a financial beating and we're trying to uh, shore those people up financially. But uh, the good news is uh, the uh, minute the IT is under a uh, new direction now with a new commissioner and she is one tough, smart woman and, uh, and I have all the confidence in the world that uh, she'll uh, take hold of this problem and straighten this out. Terrific. As individual lawmakers, are you hearing from your, uh, from your uh, folks that they're having problems with the system? I have, yeah. yeah. I've actually heard from several of my uh, constituents that it's been problematic and there's a great deal of frustration. Um, it's nice, it's one of the things that when somebody reaches out to me that I've been able to help a little bit on and maybe move them up a little bit or have another set of eyes take a look at it. So you don't have to have a big omnibus bill for that one, which is nice, <laughs> um, but it's been good. And I, and I do wanna say that with the backlog that's been there, I think they've cut it down by at least half. So. Um, we are making progress, and, and we're making good progress. It's gonna take a little more time, but we've thrown some finances at it uh, two different times, uh, some money in the future and money now um, for the remainder of this year. So it looks like we're gonna you know, get a 
a little bit extra help um, addressing this and moving it forward. So I'm hoping to see a reduction in the backlog soon. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you are watching Minnesota Legislative Report, your opportunity to call in with questions for your elected officials. Call them in right now. We'll get them asked here live on the air this afternoon. And Representative Sandstead, the uh, House okayed, I believe you're on uh, education finance, the House okayed the omnibus education finance uh, bill. It's kind of geared towards improving school uh, safety. Can you talk about that a little bit? A great deal of the K-12 portion of the bill is school safety. A lot of money given to um, uh, shoring up mental health issues, so if a school district, and loosening, loosening some parameters around how a district can spend their funds, so adding additional uh, funds and then also giving them some flexibility in how to use it. So if a district determines that they need to shore up a building, uh, maybe add uh, another entry system or locks or bulletproof glass or whatever they want to do, security surveillance, they can do that. If they want to have some resources go towards uh, mental health workers, school counselors, there's some flexibility there. So a great deal of focus on that portion. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be the only thing that's really moving in regard to any type of gun, gun safety bills. Uh, that has been a, no, a non-starter, even though every week there seems to be mm -hmm. another protest at the Capitol about that. Representative Olson, maybe you want to introduce the fact that there hasn't been any movement towards any type of gun bills? Yeah, I think that that seems to be the case and seems to be dominating some set of headlines every week at the Capitol. And we get, I, I would imagine, on both sides of the issue, we get a lot of constituent contact regardless of kind of where you are or, or your district you represent. In some way, you're getting contacted on this issue probably quite a lot. Um, and last week, we saw it elevate a little bit more with um, some of the action at the Capitol. And, you know, we, we heard after, after the sit-in that Representative Aaron Mayquay did, we heard from the Republican leadership that they had potentially cracked open the door for hearing some legislation. That door has now shut. Um, so I'm not sure what we're going to see. Probably uh, likely nothing. Um, but as we, this was uh, about two weeks ago, there was the Star Tribune report that came out that showed that you know 90% of Minnesotans supported universal background checks, and so it just seemed to heighten the issue. And so I think that was where some of the action came from last week, with the hope then that perhaps there would be some movement on this issue. Um, there was hearings on two of the bills in the House, but they were tabled, which means there was no actual action taken. But they sit on the table, which means they can come back up and could be discussed on the House floor or are voted on on the House floor. So there's potential there. I, I don't see a lot of appetite from the Republican leadership side to do anything with this. I get a lot of constituent contact from folks who do want us to tackle this issue and have, have these conversations. and. You know, and I think we, we use the term common sense gun laws, but what we're talking about, what the ask is around universal background checks, making sure we close like the gun show loophole, um, which, you know, when you talk to pretty much anyone on any side of the, uh, or any side of this issue, that seems to be something people can really, you know, agree on, hence the 90% in the, the Star Tribune. The other piece that we've been talking about is the, um, the gun, the, um, essentially if you are a threat to yourself or others that your family or law enforcement could petition a court to have a temporary um, restriction on firearms for you. And so again, those are kind of, when we talk about common sense gun laws, I find it easiest to actually say what we mean when we say that, because otherwise that's, I think, where we get into the place where it's hyperbole of, you know, we just polarize ourselves, we start talking about, sure. you know, guns in really unhelpful ways. So that, so when we're talking about what we want to see move or what people are asking us to see move, it's those two pieces of legislation. Um, and so, you know, three weeks left, we're talking about a lot of unfinished business we st still need to get done. So I'm not sure where we go from here, but, but that's a little bit of the context. Senator Simonson is, there seems to be agreement on both sides of the aisle about the need for some common sense solutions, but yet there's really no traction. What, what is there, is it too much gun lobby money or what is the reason for that uh, in your mind? I think there's agreement on both sides of the aisle until it comes time to actually vote. Mm -hmm. uh, Thursday, when we took up our uh, grand omnibus bill, Senator Latz offered uh, both of the bills that Representative Olson just spoke of uh, as amendments to that bill. Uh, and, and both times, uh, Senate Republicans voted uh, that, the, that they were not germane to the bill, and that essentially just kills the discussion. Um, so I, I do think that there's been a, a line drawn in the sand, and this has become obviously a partisan issue. Um, but, uh, you know, every day when I, when I go to the Senate floor and I look up in the gallery and you can pick out and see 
uh, the NRA lobbyists that are paying very close attention to what's happening this session, and, and it seems like they've got the ear of the Republican Party uh, to the point where we're not going to be able to advance anything. Uh, even, even things that seem relatively simple to most Minnesotans, uh, there is no traction. It, it's just not going to move this year. Representative Sandstead, with all the protesting that's going on and so much uh, apparent momentum for some type of gun control or gun, whatever, you, however you want to phrase it, what is your feeling for why nothing has happened to this point in the state legislature? I think it can be used as a bargaining chip, to be honest. Um, so, and I think it's still pretty controversial. I think a lot of um, Early on in the session, there were many different gun bills that were introduced. Um, they were not all, in my opinion, common sense, um, and certainly not all getting around uh, the things that most Minnesotas w or Minnesotans would agree on. So we've had to take some time kind of sifting through that. Um, I think there's also a conversation to be had about a balance, and I haven't, we haven't really had that conversation yet, a balance between um, reacting to a scenario, a tragic scenario that has happened, balancing that against already law-abiding citizens, and you know, I hear from both sides of that mm -hmm. conversation. Um, and I think, I think the other side of the table is hearing that too, and I think that's part of maybe why things aren't moving, and um, I don't know. I think, I think it, it could be stalemated for a variety of reasons right now. And Representative Sundin. Thank you. Uh, we've been told for the last few years that 80% of the National Rifle Association members actually favor background checks. Mm -hmm. But uh, when it comes, uh, push comes to shove uh, in the legislature, uh, I think uh, Senator Simonson outlined it uh, quite clearly that uh, with all those lobbyists in the, in the building from the National Rifle Association, there is such fear of uh, voting for maybe a common sense measure that the Republican uh, legislators and some uh, DFLers as well just simply will not do it. They will not uh, come forward with a vote. So. All right, well, we'll have to wait and see if something may happen in the future on that issue. Uh, Representative Olson, uh, you mentioned this briefly when we were talking about one of the health bills earlier, but what's the latest on the effort to get the upper hand on opioid abuse uh, that's been another one of those issues that has gotten a lot of attention. It's impacted so many families in the state. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so this is a huge crisis. Um, in our nation, in St. Louis County in particular, we have um, <coughs> this in, in our area, it's, it's a real crisis. And so we have seen legislation that was introduced at the beginning of session that would uh, would have the hold the drug manufacturers responsible, so Big Pharma responsible for their share of the problem, which is the penny a pill. It's the stewardship fee. It would generate around $15 million annually to tackle this issue. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge pot of revenue that could go towards addressing this problem. And in that legislation, as originally introduced, it had the penny a pill, so the funding mechanism, and then it had a great package of what we would do, what we would fund. Whether, you know, first responders having Narcan, treatment programs, a lot of people, um, unfortunately, when they overdose and die is when they're waiting to get in a treatment bed when they have had a period of sobriety um, and then they use maybe that one last time while they're waiting to get into a bed and, and that's often when that happens. I know Representative Sundin had a really tragic event um, in his district around this that really highlighted it was a, a young woman who was just days away from getting a treatment bed. Um, and so if we had more options for treatment, if we had Narcan for first responders, if we had you know education grants so we could do better education in schools. So this was a really good piece of legislation that was offered by a Republican whose son had died of an opioid overdose. Um, unfortunately, what happened is they actually stripped out the funding mechanism. Um, the Republican leadership is, was not willing to actually hold the manufacturers accountable, so they pulled out the funding mechanism. So now the bill travels with these great ideas around Narcan and grants and treatment beds, but unfortunately it's taking from, the proposal is to take a smaller amount from our general fund one time. That is not going to do what we need it to do to tackle what we need to tackle. If this is the crisis that we all agree it to be, the penny a pill is the way to do it. It's dedicated revenue to fund this problem paid for by the place that created this problem, the manufacturers who profited. 
um, off of this. So to say I'm disappointed to see the penny a pill would be an understatement. <laughs> and um, I'm hopeful that we will continue to push and push and push on the House side um, until we can see the penny a pill come across the finish line. And perhaps Senator Simonson could share it's a little different over there what's where, where the reality is. But um, we have a plan at the table. We just need to get it to the finish line. And Senator Simonson? So in the Senate, uh, Senator Rosen, who is the Republican chief author of this bill, has been very adamant uh, from the beginning of session that um, this is an important bill to her uh, to include the funding mechanism. And that bill is still alive. It's in the Finance Committee. Um, on Thursday on the Senate floor, there was a lot of discussion when we debated the HHS portion of the bill about this particular piece. And, and a lot of the discussion from both sides of the aisle was the expressing their frustration that these big pharmaceutical companies are not coming to the table to even participate in the discussion. And she essentially called them out and said, you know, Tuesday morning, two days from now, um, she's gonna have a hearing in the Finance Committee and they're gonna hear this bill. And if they're not coming to the table, we're gonna move forward with this bill the way that it's written with the funding mechanism in it. Um, so we can get it into a conference committee and perhaps, you know, actually get something done this year. But. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, if something's going to happen, it's going to happen there, and it might happen as early as this week. And Representative Sundin? I think the penny a pill is just somewhat of a low bar. Uh, out on the street, th these pills go for 15 bucks a piece. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know what, what the profit margin is for the uh, pharmaceuticals here, but a penny a pill is a pretty low bar. Mm -hmm. Is any part of the legislation... Uh, I know that the pharmacy, pharmaceutical companies have some, some have gotten the blame, but you know doctors do prescribe these pills. Mm -hmm. Is there any legislation out there that maybe would help monitor that or Representative Sundin? I, th I think I touched on this last week. Uh, I, I spoke with one of the uh, hospital executives here in Duluth and uh, he says, he, d he told me that he's got a one key on his computer that he can punch at any point during the day and monitor uh, every opioid that's prescribed throughout his system. And I think that's very responsible of that hospital system, of that uh, leader uh, in the medical community. And uh, they're doing a good job. Uh, the thing is, the people that are producing an overabundance of these uh, pharma uh, pharmaceuticals, it's, it's just shameful uh, what's going on. And they're profiting from it every day. And Representative Sands said anything you'd like to add to the discussion about opioids? Just that it is an epidemic. It's a, it's a terrible crisis that we're facing uh, on the range down in this area. Um, it's absolutely, in my opinion, appropriate to uh, have the big pharma kick in the penny a pill. I was sad we were in the same uh, HHS committee when that was getting stripped out. And um, it's heartbreaking because the money that they're talking about having go to the bill right now isn't going to be enough. The 15 million would go much further. And um, it's not just money for the Narcan, different things like that. We need to also um, get at getting beds available, having more beds available sooner, because it is that window of time when people are waiting to get in, where we oftentimes hear these tragedy stories and uh, real lives. Representative Olson. And I would just say to that point too about the prescribing, the governor actually had a press conference this week and released new um, prescribing guidelines. And historically the, the legislature has done a good job at working with the hospitals and other prescribers on this issue. So, so it's not that maybe we're not seeing it done this session. That has, we have already been doing and made huge movement on that. And the governor is continuing to do that and put out those new guidelines this week. So when he issues those, is that something that is mandatory or is that for the legislature to act on or how does that work? That's a great question and I, I think he just introduced those at the end of last week so we'll see remain be seen but he's doing that with the department so I'm, the department is working with the providers and the whole host of the, you know, the Department of Health and um, in the DHS and whatnot. So there, it's all of the agencies working with the governor on that. All right, uh, Representative Olson, we're going to come right back to you. We've got a call from Larry from Duluth, and Larry is wondering, do you, and I think he means by you, means the legislature, have any intent to help our senior citizens? We are one of 11 states that still taxes Social Security. Will this ever change? Okay. We hear this question pretty much every session. Yeah, that's a great question, and I would maybe turn it back to some of the folks that have been around. We had a tax bill last year that did address some of that, and maybe one of those can speak to the specific piece about the tax portion. I will just speak to the senior piece, though, uh, about just senior care. I've touched on a few times as well. 
um, that one of the issues I'm working and others are working on is um, after we kind of learn the scale of how many complaints were coming to the, the state around uh, abuse and neglect of our elders, um, that their governor called a work group together last summer or last interim um, to look at this issue. And they put forward a set of recommendations and these were consumers, so groups that represented people from our district in our area. And they put forward a set of recommendations that the legislature could act on this year. And it was everything from, um, you know, it was just a whole myriad of things. but. And unfortunately, we're not seeing that bill being uh, really moving at all this year. We're seeing bits and pieces and some pretty watered down ways of doing that. But to Larry's point, I think this is something we should all come together around as, as we've talked about the gray tsunami is coming. And we're already seeing so many people in our district that are living in these facilities that are needing the care. And we need to protect these folks to make sure there's not deceptive marketing practices and people aren't going into a facility that's promising one thing and they're paying. I mean, I had someone in my district who's paying $8,000 a month. Um, to be in a facility. Uh, it's a husband and wife. The wife's still at home. The husband's in the facility. And he's, he's not getting what he was told he would get when he'd get there. But there's nothing we can do because we actually don't even <coughs> license some of these facilities. So I think, um, you know, to Larry's point, he's asking one specific question. But I think there's a whole host of things that are a ways we need to protect seniors' well-being in their pocketbooks to make sure that um, we're doing what we can. So I'm going to continue to push for this package of legislation this session because I, I think we still have time. And I know the governor is behind this package and hope we can do something on that point. But I'll, I'll let others touch on the other pieces. Representative Sundin. The underlying problem with uh, giving uh, the seniors a tax break uh, on the Social Security end, which I'd love to see, is the tax revenue is generated from that. If you pull that out of the general fund, uh, how do you backfill that mm -hmm. to maintain services at the level that, uh, that we need to do in the state? So uh, I'd be thrilled to see that if uh, there's a plan to backfill the money. And Senator Simonson, what about on the Senate side? This issue comes up frequently. It comes up every year uh, and it's a great point and it's a great question and we should continue the conversation. But Representative Sundin hit the nail on the head. The problem is that uh, it puts our budget into a deficit, you know, going into the future and there's just no way to backfill that hole just yet. Part of our process includes projecting into, you know, out bienniums about what our, our budget will look like. And, and I think right now Minnesota is in a place where we have a structurally balanced budget uh, for the first time in, in a long time, really. And, and looking ahead, we want to make sure that it stays structurally balanced and we don't send ourselves into a deficit. But it, it's a great point. But as our, as our population continues to age, more and more people are going to be collecting those pensions. Uh, and, and if you take away that tax revenue, we, we leave a huge hole in our, in our general fund. And it's just a matter of, okay, what, what are we going to do? Are we going to bring income in from somewhere else? Uh, or are we going to cut spending in certain areas? Or how are we going to do this? I mean, we all would love to do it uh, without a doubt, I'm sure. But it's just a matter of how we get there. Someone has to come up with a plan that uh, replaces the, the money. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative Olson, Jane from Duluth has a Pretty specific question, but maybe you can help her out. How can I get a hold of Minnesota Care or Minsure for service issues? Who's the right person to talk to? Do you have some advice for Jane? Well, I think Jane could reach out if I'm her representative. She could certainly email or call my office and we could connect her with the right people. Um, Minsure does have a helpline. Even at its busiest time, I think they are now under four minute waits, um, which is so I think there's still a lot of. Uh, worry about, oh, you know, we hear a lot still is Minsure's not working. That's just not true. Um, that you can get you can get a hold of someone, you can call the call center, and you can hopefully have a wait that's under four minutes, which seems pretty reasonable. So, um, so I'd say that. The other thing is, though, what I would actually say, so feel free to reach out to any of us. We can connect you with whoever you need. Um, feel free to call the helpline if you just want to go independently. The other thing is, um, there's n the people called navigators, which are free resources in your community that can help you answer all of those questions. And so they are at the Duluth Public Library, Community Action Duluth. Um, I think there's even some that are mobile and are all over town, the Lake Superior Community Health Center. So they're people, they're, they're just what their title says, they're navigators. They can help you get through the system, whether you're on Minnesota Care, needing to enroll in health insurance through Minsure whatever it may be, that these people are free resources in your community. And so you can go to um, Ensure Duluth is the name of the coalition of all of these navigators. So Jane could certainly reach out to any one of those navigators. They would sit down with her, walk her through everything. And she also can email any of us, or if she's my constituent, email me. Um, and we can hook her up with that as well. And uh, those navigators, I thought they just worked 
part of the year when people are signing up, but actually they're available year round. They're available year, year round. I think they beef up um, their presence probably at the library and other places that are kind of hubs around that time of year during open enrollment, but they're around. Um, if you just have, if you're already enrolled and you kind of have questions about your changing income levels or things, that they're here to help you all year long, so. All right. Uh, Senator Simonson, a judge this week ruled that the Enbridge Line 3 replacement pipeline should follow the existing route. What role does the legislature play in this issue? This is another one of those controversial issues. Well, in theory, the legislature should not play a role in this issue. Um, doesn't mean that they won't, or doesn't mean that legislators won't try. Uh, but, you know, it's very, it's, it may seem simple for a judge to make a ruling like that, but it really complicates the process now. Mm -hmm. uh, to follow the, the original pipeline, uh, the exact same pipeline, puts you in the problem that they're crossing property that perhaps property owners don't want to be crossed. Uh, and it's specific to tribal property and tribal lands. And, and that is, there is such uh, an issue there between uh, the company and these tribals and these tribes. Um, I don't know how they resolve that. And I think that was the idea about going around some of these properties is to try to avoid some of that confrontation. Um, so what happens now at this point in time, I don't know. We, I actually, we actually heard a bill in the committee this year that essentially said, you know, uh, as soon as the bill is signed into law that the, uh, the energy company can build the pipeline wherever they want. Mm -hmm. it, just as plain and simple as that. And I mean, that obviously isn't going anywhere, but I think it indicates a sense of frustration from some lawmakers that this process has just gone on too long. But I want to respect the process of the PUC and see what they come up with now that the administrative law judges have made this determination. Mm -hmm. All right, we just have a couple of minutes left. Uh, and we've got a big week coming up and I know one of the first bills to be heard on the House floor Monday is gonna be the House tax bill, the omnibus tax bill. Uh, Representative Sandstead, maybe you can talk about that a little bit and we'll just kind of go down the line and talk about what you see coming up in the next week here. Um. In a very simplified uh, take on the whole thing, I, I think for uh, middle class Minnesotans, it's not going to be the great tax break that people are anticipating. I know when I had my taxes done, um, they did a side by side and uh, my preparer said, I'll actually pay in 21 more dollars. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we're hearing s some talk of tax rate decreases. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't think it's gonna be I, I kind of think I get the sense it's going to be a whole lot of do nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to talk about tax bills? What's happening on the Senate side? So I think Monday or Tuesday is the Senate's plan to actually introduce their tax bill, which we have not seen yet. So uh, I'll be curious to see what's in it and, and how it compares to the House plan. But I am, uh, I don't know, we'll reserve opinion until we see what's actually in it. Representative Olson? Yeah, I would just echo what Representative Sandstead said that I think we had the opportunity to do to do what we needed to to help middle class families, working class families, and I think this tax bill falls short of that. And um, maybe we'll over promise and under deliver from what we're hearing right now. And also I think, you know, as Duluth folks who voted on a uh, this past election, we voted for the dedicated sales tax for the roads. Um, unfortunately, we did not see that um, in the tax bill. And so we're still waiting to see how and when that's gonna take shape because it's 70% of Duluthians say that they wanted this. So I don't think the legislature should hold that hostage under any account. Um, that's something we need for our community. And obviously the, the people of our community think that. So I'm hopeful we can still see that too. I mean, that's a missing part of our tax discussion right now at the legislature. Representative Sundin, in situations like that, sometimes in the conference committee, things like that can be added back in. Uh, if it's not in the bill, is that true or not? Or? Yeah, we haven't seen the final product and we won't probably until the second to the last day of session. <laughs> <laughs> you serve on transportation uh, finance, Representative Sundin. Anything yeah. significant happening uh, this year with transportation funding? Well, that uh, constitutional amendment uh, that, that's coming forward uh, has got me up at night and uh, mm -hmm. it, it bothers me to no end. In fact, I, I just, uh, crafted a letter to the editor that's going out statewide uh, asking people to uh, become educated on this issue and uh, educate their legislator as well and uh, try to uh, deny this uh, opportunity to get this on the ballot. Uh, can you explain a little <coughs> bit what, what that's uh, going to con be? A constitutional amendment is uh, can go on the ballot with a simple majority of the legislator and it can't be a uh, uh, legislator and can't be uh, vetoed by the governor. So. Uh, 
there's a effort afoot to uh, dedicate all the sales tax money from car parts and services into the general fund, or excuse me, into the trunk highway fund, which would remove it from the general fund, which there again, you're not backfilling it. So someone else is uh, taking a beating for uh, uh, new roads. And I'm all about new roads, but uh, they should pay for themselves. I'm a proponent of an uh, increased gas tax, and it would be a hefty one if, uh, if I had my way, and we'd have uh, a robust ongoing fund for uh, good roads in Minnesota. And we wouldn't uh, kick uh, grandma out of the nursing home doing so. Ever been any momentum in Minnesota for toll roads? That's how some states handle, handle it. Uh, they put in tolls on certain highways? Not on my watch. <laughs> That's pretty definitive. Well, we are out of time. I want to thank each of you for being here. Representative Mike Sundin, Representative Liz Olson, Senator Eric Simonson, and Representative Julie Sandstead. Appreciate your being here today. Good luck with the uh, last three weeks of the session. We are out of time this week on Minnesota Legislative Report. I want to thank our crew here in the studio, and thanks to everyone who called with their questions today. Please, enjoy, please join us again next Sunday for our final program of the session. I'm Greg Grell. Have a great evening.